Hello and welcome to this video presentation. My name is Mohamed Bashir and I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. This video will be split in three parts. The first part will be an introductory video that I made for you to get engaged to the topic and get to know more about the background and the motivations behind this work. The second part will be looking at what we did in this research point, what we did in terms of the results, the discussions, and also the conclusions. The third part will touch upon what else we did since we submitted this work, which was supposed to be the future work of this paper. So let's start first with the introductory video, and we will be back in a few minutes. The world is currently facing a new challenge. Our population is massively increasing. And as you watch this video, our population exceeded 7.5 billion. The continuing population growth and urbanization is estimated to add around 2.5 billion people to our population by 2050. It is also estimated that more than 60% of the global population will be living in cities. As a consequence, a new challenge is now present for us to deal with. This is the massive urbanization. In addition to the classic challenges like pollution, climate change, and food security, we are facing human migration to the big cities. And that leads to high competition on housing, especially within the developing countries, which adds a huge burden for these governments to deal with. These figures show the effect of the massive urbanization on the biggest cities around the world. It shows the population in 2010, then showing how the growth is expected to be massive for some of these cities, and also how the locations of the world's biggest cities is moving from being spread around the world to be mainly within Africa and Southeast Asia. Within these cities, people are and will be competing for spaces to live. They just want to be near the big economical cities. With all the economic challenges that these countries are already facing, local governments would have nothing to do to accommodate all these people within planned housing facilities. And that's where the problem starts. Informal settlements will start to appear. You may also call these shanties or favelas, depending on where in the world you are. These settlements are built organically by the people, and they mainly use cheap and non-robust materials for construction, like steel sheets. Statistically speaking, in today's world, more than 30% of urban population are living in informal settlements. That's around 1 billion people. These are some of the biggest informal settlements around the globe. Kalicha in Cape Town, South Africa, Kaiberia in Nairobi, Kenya, and Aravi in Mumbai, India, which is home to more than 1 million people. And as you can see, these settlements' population exceeds the population of some of the capital cities in the West. However, these are built in a very limited space, and also with absolutely no fire safety facilities. As you probably expected, many destructive fires occurred within these settlements worldwide in the past few years. For example, in Misamayitu in South Africa 2017, Kijiji, Kenya in 2018, and Dhaka, Bangladesh in 2019. It's shocking to see that in a single fire, and in a matter of hours, thousands of homes could be destroyed. The amount of damage and lost livelihood it's just an immense amount of people being displaced and having to rebuild their lives. These fires occurred mainly due to the design of these settlements, for example, the dwelling's proximity and the building materials, but also due to the lack of knowledge and planning for the local authorities to deal with such fires. That is the motivation of our work at the University of Edinburgh. An international project, namely improving the resilience of informal settlements to fire, was established in collaboration with the Stellenbosch University in South Africa, Iris Fire follows an interdisciplinary approach based on engineering, social, and geographic sciences. One of the main aims of Iris Fire is to fill the gap of knowledge in fire science when it comes to informal settlements, fire dynamics, and fire spread. We believe that if we can understand what is going on at a fundamental level, we can use this information to improve the safety of millions around the world. So we first gathered data through surveys and interviews to better understand these communities, both in an engineering perspective and also in a social one. The project started with focus on the informal settlements, mainly within Western Cape, South Africa, but with time it extended to other countries like India, Brazil and Costa Rica, and also many more. In this specific presentation, we'll be looking at understanding in a small and a fundamental scale, what are the main differences between the normal residential compartments and the informal settlements compartments when it comes to the conditions for flashover, for example. The work is based on experimental, numerical, and theoretical approaches 
to understand how using steel sheets as a building material could influence the fire dynamics in these compartments. Does the same classic empirical correlations holds in this case when we got like these thermally thin boundaries? What about the conditions needed for flashover? And how to use both experimental and numerical approaches to answer all these questions? Welcome back. So as we saw, it's a massive problem. It is very unfortunate that in the fire community, we can't take quick actions to deal with this. That's mainly because of the gaps of knowledge. We don't know a lot of information about these dwellings or even the main parameters that affect the fire spread in these settlements. For example, let's have a look on this figure that was done by one of our colleagues from Stellenbosch University, Dr. Richard Waltz. This figure was based on some of the surveys that they did back in, back in Cape Town, and it shows um, the choice of the walls that they choose the thin boundaries using corrugated steel sheets and also the timber frames that they use to connect between these steel sheets which lead to um, this poor construction and a lot of gaps between the walls and then the fuel loads that we don't really have a lot of information about it it could go very high or very low and also the ventilation conditions for these compartments so there's a lot of parameters that we need to first put hands on and understand how these affect the fire dynamics we also need to check the literature and know what we can and can't use in terms of the theoretical and empirical models when dealing with these uh, compartments. That is mainly to avoid misleading information and understanding for these fires. Before designing our experiments at Iris Fire, we usually go back to the normal theoretical models and well-known empirical equations to estimate things like the heat release rate needed for flashover, the peak heat release rate and peak temperatures and so on. And one of the things that we were trying to use is the well-known MQH equation, which gives you the needed heat release rate for a, for a compartment to reach flashover. Once we use this in our case, we found that we get unrealistic information. And that is mainly because this equation was based on two things, the geometry of the compartment and also a heat transfer coefficient. And this heat transfer coefficient, in addition to an empirical number, was based on a lot of experiments to like a parametric study that they did to end up with this equation. And this parametric study was based on like a variety of experiments. And these experiments was mainly thermally thick walls. And that's the main difference between what we're trying to do and what others have been doing in fire science for a long time. So in this study, we are trying to kind of replicate the MQH methodology or their equation, but with another equation that could fit in these conditions. This work will be based on three stages. The first one is experimental, where we're going to use a small scale experiment fire test uh, under the lab hood. The second part will be numerical. We're going to use these fire experiments to validate a CFD model, namely fire dynamic simulator, and then conduct um, a variety of compartment fire tests using this validated model. The third part will be theoretical, where we're going to use the results from the parametric study to understand the system as a whole and how the walls interact with the fire dynamics to experimentally model the informal settlement dwellings. In this study, we used a quarter scale ISO 9705 room, which was made out of corrugated steel sheets with 0.51 millimeter thick. We also got to have a door in the front wall of these dwellings with dimensions of 0.2 by 0.5, and the dimensions of the compartments are as shown. The compartment was placed under the calorimetry hood in the fire lab at the University of Edinburgh to capture the gases or the products from this experiment and estimate the heat release rate needed for flashover. The fuel used in this experiment was the polypropyridine to be able to kind of mimic the hydrocarbon based fuels like the plastic furniture and electrical utilities and also we used a 20 ml heptane as a igniter or as a accelerant for the ignition or start of ignition of these experiments. For the measurements, we used uh, thermocouples at the four corners, thermocouple trees at the four corners to capture the gas layer temperature. And also we used TSCs at the front door and also at the side wall to kind of measure the heat fluxes from the compartment. To measure the velocity, we added bi-directional flow props at the door at three different locations. So as we said in the introduction, these conditions or these experiments didn't really fit in most of the empirical and theoretical models we got in literature. Therefore, we were not really able to define exactly the amount of fuel load that we need to add in this compartment in order to reach flash over. So we decided to use a um, few different fuel loads, starting with 24, 32, um, 40 and 80 megajoule per meter square. 
We also defined our criteria for flash over to be once we see a sustained external plume from the door or once the gas layer temperature reach a uh, temperature difference of 525C. But before we actually use this test to validate the FDS, we wanted to make sure that we can repeat the test to check the repeatability of these experiments. So as you can see in this figure, we repeated the four experiments once more time and we got almost perfect repeatability for all of the four cases. So now we are sort of confident with what we did in the experimental work and we can start to use this to validate the FDS model. To validate the fire dynamic simulator, um, CFD model, we used the 40 megajoule per meter square case and we followed the following methodology to try to validate the FDS or to set up the model that we used in this study. Um, we used the sample perils model, that means we used the heat release rate um, curve from the experiments and have it as an input to the model. We also modeled all the devices to get all the point measurements like uh, model the 1.5 millimeter thermocouples and we used the radiative heat flux gas to capture the radiative heat flux at the door and next to the walls. We also used the total velocity device in FDS to capture the velocities at the door. We kept the turbulence and radiation model as a default for the FDS. We also did, which is the most importantly, a cell sensitivity analysis. We started with 10 centimeter um, cell size and went down to 5 and then 2.5 centimeter. And as is shown in this graph, the 5 centimeter was found to be the most efficient um, cell size to use. We then compared the normal point measurements like temperatures, uh, flow velocities and external heat fluxes. And all the results were really promising and well replicated the experiments with accuracy of around 10%. So now we have like repeatable experiments and then we have a validated CFD model so we can start to do our permitting study. Thanks to the MQH correlation, we now know that there is a good correlation between the heat release rate needed for flashover and the compartment geometry in addition to a heat transfer coefficient. So we mostly are not going to touch upon the geometry of the compartment and we have to focus on updating, as we said, the heat transfer coefficient. The validated model then was used to conduct this parametric study using six different um, walls with different thermal properties and also four different ventilation factors with a total of 24 um, compartment fires. This table is showing the final results. So clearly there was a relationship between the ventilation factor and the heat release rate needed for flashover, but there was also a relationship between the heat release rate needed for flashover and the emissivity of the walls. And that is sort of a, you know, primarily a founding or a primarily conclusion. So we need to actually prove it with a theoretical analysis. So what we are trying to do now, we are trying to use the results from the parametric study to end up with a heat transfer coefficient that could fit in an empirical equation for the thermethane bounded compartments. To do that, we started with a total heat transfer coefficient using this equation. Using this equation, we actually are accounting for um, the thermal resistance by conductivity, um, radiation, and also by convection. We then computed the total heat transfer coefficient for every single case in the parametric study using the FDS results, and then plotted this against the heat release rate needed for flashover. As you can see, there is a strong relationship. But at the same time, we can't rely on such a complex parameter like the total heat transfer coefficient, which needs a lot of, you know, the outputs of the experimental and numerical work to be computed. That actually not fitting the idea of the empirical equation because we want to use the empirical equation to design a fire before even doing experiments. So we tried it to simplify it a little bit. First, we got rid of um, the convective term and the relationship still stands. So we sort of on the right track. Then we got rid of the convective term and we still see that the relationship between the heat transfer coefficient and the total heat release rate or the heat release rate needed for flash over stands well. But once we change the radiative term, this relationship sort of collapsed. So we knew that the key parameter here is the radiative term. So we started to plot the radiative term against the heat release rate needed for flashover and found out that it is almost the same relationship and we could use this term to end up with an empirical equation. With some mass, we were able to link between the radiative heat transfer coefficient and the wall temperature and the gas surrounding it. 
we then were able to empirically correlate between these temperatures and the emissivity of the walls, the geometry of the compartment, and an empirical factor. By that, we ended up with a simple empirical equation that we could use to calculate the heat release rate or estimate the heat release rate needed for flashover in these compartments. After that, we conducted eight other thermomethane bounded compartment fires via FDS to check the accuracy of the new correlation. And as shown in this figure, the red dots for the testing compartments matched well with the new equation, with variation of only 10 to 15 percent, which shows the good accuracy of this new correlation. At the end of this study, we conducted a numerical sensitivity analysis to compare between the effect of different wall thermal properties for both thermally thin and thermally thick bounded compartments, where more details about this study is presented within the paper. As overall, this sensitivity study gave us a bit of more understanding of the interaction between the walls and the fire dynamics in thermally thin bounded compartments. At this early stage of this research topic, we think that the thermally thin walls quickly absorbs the heat from the initial fire before flashover, and then the whole area of the walls heats up due to the high conductivity, which then acts as a radiant panel and re-radiates back to other cold objects within the compartment. And that plays an important role when it comes to the critical heat release rate needed for flashover and also the time to reach flashover. That is in contrast with the thermally thick walls where walls have the capacity to keep absorbing heat without having the walls reaching high enough temperature to be radiating significant amount of energy back to cold objects. Therefore, that proves again that the emissivity of the thermally thin walls plays an important role before flashover and needs further studies and also proves that we cannot use the current knowledge that is based on thermally thick compartments to deal with this scenario. So to conclude this work, we first started with the experimental approach. We conducted underventilated compartment fires with thermally thin boundaries. These experiments were then used to validate an FDS model, which was the base of a parametric study. The parametric study was used to conduct an empirical equation for the heat release rate needed for flashover for thermally thin compartments. It also proved that the dominant heat transfer coefficient in thermally thin compartments is the radiative heat transfer coefficient. After this work, we followed the same methodology in order to upgrade our empirical equation to fit with more realistic conditions and also large scale compartment fires. My colleague Dr. Yu Wang will be presenting in this symposium some of our large scale compartment fire experiments that we did in Iris Fire. We then used this experimental work to validate the FDS model, which was a bit more complex process, and then we used the same FDS model to create an empirical equation that fits to these conditions. Talking about large-scale experiment with wood crypt as a fuel load. We then also used this parametric study to further understand the fire dynamics in these compartments. For example, when it comes to the conditions needed for flashover in thermometing compartments. So I would like to invite you to have a look on this open access fire technology paper after you read the paper in the symposium, of course, to further understand kind of the full story of the work in this research topic. So that's all from my side. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'm looking forward to discuss further with you during the symposium. Stay safe and talk to you later.